Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello to all of you gathered here this evening. My name is Sumaya Al Hadrami, Director of Conferences Department at Trends Research and Advisory. I'm really delighted to see such a large turnout of this event during these desperate COVID times. I take this opportunity to thank all those who have traveled thousands of miles to be here in person, and of course, those who are going to be joining us virtually at various stages during the summit. Trans Research and Advisory is excited about embarking on a journey that is truly unique and inherently path-breaking. We are gathered here to provide thought leaders, resources, and cutting-edge research to help think tanks develop critical and beneficial strategies so they can thrive in today's highly competitive marketplace of ideas and policy advice. My first duty this evening is to extend a warm welcome and a note of thanks to our partners in this event, the Think Tanks and Civil Societies Program, Lauder Institute, University of Pennsylvania. And a special thanks goes to Mr. James McGann and his team. Um, James McGann, of course, the director of the TTCSP. Uh, they have not only thrown its weight behind this event, they have also flown in to join us in this endeavor. We welcome you all to the exciting city of Dubai and wish you a lovely stay here. We also look forward to your inputs and participation throughout this summit meeting. I would also like to outline the goals of this forum briefly. During the course of this event, we intend to assess effective strategies that could help think tanks identify the next generation of researchers, discuss the operational challenges think tanks face in recruiting talent, to empower young people and enhance their research and academic capabilities, and to develop and empower qualified young researchers. On that note, I would like to thank you all again for taking part and supporting us in this event. As we begin the summit, we have two welcoming remarks, and the first one will be delivered by Dr. James McGann, Director of the Think Tanks and Civil Societies Program. Dr. McGann, please, the floor is yours. Sorry, I have to find my glasses or I'm lost. It's a problem of being mature here. I want to make a hearty welcome to all of you. Uh, as was mentioned, have traveled near and far to participate in this uh, very timely and important forum, the 2021 Think Tank Talent for the Future Forum. And to thank our uh, host, Trends, for bringing this idea to TTCSP, for hosting this event, and for effectively, in a very short period of time, forging a close personal and team effort to make this incredibly complex uh, and highly problematic uh, forum possible in the moments uh, and the time in which we live. I want to thank all of you, uh, the brave, the fearless, who have traveled uh, at great uh, obstacles in terms of making it here today. But I said to my colleague from the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies that we must continue to strike out to, us, to prove that think tanks make a difference, that we are willing not only to think great thoughts, but to be on the front lines to help save lives and livelihoods. And at certain times, we need to prove the possibility and the potential of think tanks by merely doing, by being together, by saying it is possible. And there are many moments during 
the six months that we have been planning this that we doubted whether we could do it, whether we could move forward, but both institutions persevered uh, and all of you who have come today are a testament to the importance of thinking through the challenges we face. We have, over the years, had a commitment to the very subject of this forum. And so it was in a moment uh, when Trends presented to me the possibility of doing a summit, a forum on uh, the issues of uh, talent and the future of talent for think tanks. We six or seven years ago had a uh, meeting on think tank innovation and a central pillar of that meeting was the importance of diversity and innovation, the next generation of think tank scholars and executives, something that personally I have been concerned for most of my career. Where are the best and brightest going to come from? How can we assure uh, that we will have vibrant uh, and innovative institutions. We also recently, and many of the women, and I am, uh, must note that more than any other summit we have had, there are more women at this summit than uh, proportionally, in terms of size of summits, than any other summit we have had in the past. And they are playing vital and critical roles in this forum. We recently had a women and think tanks summit looking at how do you break the glass ceiling in the ivory tower. We are looking forward um, in terms of what are the challenges that think tanks face and once again this moment that we are in poses very fundamental and in many respects existential challenges. Uh, to our institutions, and we need to think about how are we going to respond. Clearly, we need to innovate, we need to adapt. But one of the issues uh, that I you know, want to focus on is why do we need to care about these issues? One, because it is in our national interest of each and every country that is represented here. Secondly, because we need to be better, faster, smarter, more digital, more innovative, and what COVID has taught us, more agile. This means we have to think about new business models. And at the core of the new business model is how do we staff our institutions? How do we retain and nurture scholars and executives? And finally, COVID has certainly uh, taught us and essentially demonstrated quite um, profoundly and directly the fact <clears throat> that those institutions, because COVID has accelerated and intensified trends that were in play for some time, but really brought them together, crystallized them, and challenged institutions in a way that we had never before thought possible. I thought that the great existential crisis for think tanks would be AI. But it has, and once again, it is one of those things where you don't see it. I did not see a global pandemic and certainly did not see even though I teach global issues and I said to my students, we are long overdue um, for a pandemic, a global pandemic, but I didn't one understand one that it would be so near and that the implications would be so disruptive and transformative. And what is clear and what is important for this meeting today and tomorrow is the fact that those institutions, and this I think is the most important message, those institutions that had transformed their institutions in advance, meaning that they were more digital, they were more agile, 
They essentially created staffing patterns and communications and had those in place, have weathered this COVID crisis much better than others. And that's the key message that I think we need to understand. We have an obligation. I am personally committed to making sure that those who are strong, those who have weathered the storm, those who have introduced effective strategies and new business models uh, for think tanks are sharing those to those who need our help, who need to be strengthened, because I believe in the ecology of the think tank community, the global community, that weakness and problems in one community uh, affect the entire community, and it is our obligation to make sure that the think tank ecology is strong and endures, because I believe ideas, think tanks, and evidence matters. If there is anything that also reverberates as a result of the COVID crisis is the challenge to that, and in many respects, the work on the future of think tanks and policy advice, what I envisioned that long before COVID, uh, because I was concerned about the attack on uh, evidence and truth. But it is now even more relevant thinking about the future of think tanks, as we will do over the next two days. And so, the program over the next uh, day or so will focus on key lessons uh, in the areas of communications um, and the new business models that I have referred to. The first session, which we will uh, have this evening, will look at 50,000 feet. What are the institutional challenge that major think tanks from around the world face? What are their countries face? And what are the institutional challenges uh, that uh, key institutions face and how they have met them from the CEO's perspective. Looking, you know, I have this whole operation, this institution to care for. How do I make sure that we survive, that we endure, so that we can continue to serve the citizens in our country and region? The second, and I would say that that panel is comprised of mature leaders from institutions around the world. Consciously, the second panel is looking to the future and will be comprised of some of the future leaders uh, in terms of institutions, scholars, uh, and executives. The third, which is a concern that, and was an integral part of the innovations, Think Tank's Innovation Summit, is the connection that corporations have adopted uh, quite effectively, the diversity and innovations connection. I always say that I'm not, I, I am committed to diversity, but I'm not committed because some donor has told me that I must diversify my workforce or that uh, funding is provided for that. As a head of a think tank, we should be doing it because it is in the interest of making our institutions innovative. All of the other things certainly are important and we must be committed to them, but there is a connection between diversity and innovation. And then the final segment of the program will focus on both a broader but specifically connected to the human resource challenge and the future of think tanks, how do we prepare for an uncertain future? And I tell my students that the only thing that will be certain is change. And we have certainly, in terms of COVID, understood uh, the disruptive aspects of change and how we need to adapt and understand that Plan A is out the window, Plan B is out the window, Plan C is out the window, and we need to understand the dynamics of change and be able, as institutions, to be nimble and adaptive. And so I look forward uh, to the next two days of discussion. Uh, I think that the we are at a critical moment that all of our 
workplaces and workforces have been disrupted and transformed, and we have assembled, despite the extraordinary circumstances in which this conf uh, summit takes place, that we have um, assembled an, an exceptional group of panelists and speakers, uh, and I hope that those who are with us from around the world will benefit from the wisdom and the experience of the panelists and keynote speakers. Thank you once again. I think we should give you all a round of applause for making it here, for being a part of this exceptional effort and the triumphant effort of trends in bringing this uh, program on. Thank you very much. Dr. McGann, thanks again for those words and for helping us make this summit such a huge success. I now invite Dr. Mohammed Abdullah Ali, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Trends Research and Advisory, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Kindly note that the remarks will be in Arabic. You can use the translation devices on the table and switch to the English channel number one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. Dr. James Magan, Dr. James Magan, Director of TTCSP in Pennsylvania University, heads of think tanks and experts taking part in this forum, distinguished guests. Peace be upon you. We welcome you to this important uh, forum that is uh, organized in presence in uh, the UAE, despite all the difficult circumstances that were imposed by the COVID pandemic on the world as a whole. And uh, we hope that soon we will see the end of this unprecedented, unprecedented humanitarian crisis that inspired many lessons including the importance of uh, enhancing cooperation and coordination between think tanks around the world in order to propose ideas, solutions, and approaches that will allow us uh, to face uh, present and future challenges that the world might face. This will also allow us to have a better future for our communities and our people as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, think tanks face increasing challenges in their mission, whether at the level of the strategic analysis because of the large volume of data and information that flow in around the clock in an attempt to have foresight about the future, as well as to recruit qualified talent that have the needed capabilities and information to be able to address the fast-paced changes in the world. This applies to information and technology. And another challenge is in having the needed financing in order to continue their mission to achieve uh, their uh, goals uh, for peace, uh, development, and prosperity. This is why Trends uh, Research and Advisory wanted uh, to collaborate with the think tanks and civil societies program at the Pennsylvania University in order to organize this uh, forum jointly. This uh, forum will discuss uh, strategic and uh, executive uh, difficulties uh, in order to recruit uh, talents, retain them, and develop the effective strategies to help think tanks in identifying the future generation of researchers. We all agree that youth are the most important force behind development and prosperity in any community to build countries and help them have a leading role. They are the ones who have the 
power to induce positive change for their benefit, the benefit of their communities and the world. We all agree that investing in youth and developing their capabilities as well as working with them hand in hand to push forward growth and prosperity, including engaging them in the development of their countries is important. This requires that we listen to them, get their ideas, uh, work on implementing their recommendations and empower them in decision-making uh, positions at all levels. All of this will allow us uh, to collectively achieve our common goals. And the most important benefit in investing in the youth is to develop their research capabilities, their critical thinking, constructive criticism, and help them better understand the developments happening around them locally, regionally, and internationally, and to develop their capabilities in order to propose ideas to face uh, the challenges before us all. We should prepare them to be specialized experts that will help us uh, build uh, the future we all aspire to. Let us agree that this mission is not solely exclusive to think tanks. However, this is something that touches on or uh, that should uh, see the engagement of all education institutions, training uh, centers among others, however, the leading role should be played by the think tanks and research centers. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, empowering youth in scientific research, developing their talent and capabilities is a high priority trend because this contributes the most to the prosperity of communities. Developing the role of youth so will ensure that they contribute in building their countries and in uh, ensuring leadership of these uh, countries. In that context uh, comes uh, the importance that TRENS uh, gives uh, to empowering youth in scientific research. This is translated through a number of important initiatives that were adopted by TRENS since its inception. And uh, we mentioned, for, for example, uh, the launch of the TRENS Youth Council for Scientific research directed or managed independently by the youth in uh, trends. We also have a youth program that allows the publication of research and studies produced by uh, youth to present their ideas in different uh, regional, international, and domestic issues. Also, yesterday in this hall, we had uh, the first trans uh, dialogue between think tanks and media, and we had a number of editors, uh, editors of magazines, heads of media offices, and directors of some research centers to discuss two important points. First of all, the cooperation between media and research in order to raise awareness between the youth, and second, we discussed the role of youth in research and media institutions as uh, the world uh, as a whole gives importance uh, to youth and their role in sustainable development. As a continuation of that, we organized today's conference in collaboration between uh, the Trends Research and Advisory and uh, the TTCSP from Pennsylvania University, and uh, this uh, forum focuses on how the youth can be empowered and their role promoted in think tanks around the world. This underlines our uh, commitment to empower the youth, foster their capabilities in uh, research. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, in conclusion, I can only extend our heartfelt uh, gratitude to our partners in organizing this important international forum. Our colleagues from TTCSP and uh, the uh, team in Dr. Magan, through our cooperation, we were capable of, we were capable of or overcoming a lot of challenges in order to organize this uh, forum. And I would like to thank the great team of trends that worked diligently to ensure the success of this forum.
I would like also to thank all think tanks, experts uh, taking part in uh, this uh, forum. We are sure that their ideas, their visions, and their propositions that we will be collecting during the uh, sessions of this forum will help in organizing, in, uh, sorry, in achieving the goal of uh, this forum organized in the UAE. Thank you very much for your attention. And allow me with you to welcome His Excellency Zaki Anwar and Seba, the cultural advisor to His Highness the President and Chancellor of the UAE University. Sir, the floor is yours uh, for the opening remark. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good evening. It gives me great pleasure to address this forum today and to make some opening remarks. It is an honor that the forum takes place in the United Arab Emirates, a country that both advocates and pursues tolerance and constructive dialogue. You are gathered here today to discuss a matter of great concern to people in positions of leadership and responsibility, youth empowerment and the development of young people's skills, capacity and talents are vital issues. Your discussions today will help cultivate thought and new directions. I therefore congratulate Trends Research and Advisory and the Lord Institute at the University of Pennsylvania for having brought us together today. At present, across the world, all organizations are searching for new ways to attract, develop, and retain talented people. The more successful they are in doing this, the greater their likelihood of achieving their goals and excelling in their fields of work. This pursuit of talent is all the more important for research and academic institutions because these organizations provide thought leadership, innovative ideas and recommendations for policy and decision makers. When they are successful in securing talent, they are better positioned to provide inspiring strategies to effect positive change for the good and well-being of their societies. Globalization implies and requires that people and their ideas circulate freely. This makes it both important and difficult for countries and organizations to retain talent. They must work hard to provide an environment that is both attractive to people and conducive to their best efforts. Here in the UAE, we invest tremendous effort to ensure our environment is supportive and stimulating so that our workforce is creative and innovative. Our record is impressive in this regard. In 2020, the Global Talent Competitiveness Index ranked the UAE first in the region and 22nd in the world. It is an index that measures the performance of 132 countries in terms of their success in competing for talent. It examines the policies and practices which countries use to attract, develop, retain, and empower the talent that is vital for advancing economic and social prosperity. The UAE leadership places a priority on our country's capacity to pursue sustainable development. It wishes to attract talent in all the disciplines necessary to this purpose. It has a national strategy directed to the purpose of attracting global talent in strategic sectors and to position the country amongst the best on the Global Talent Competitiveness Index. As part of its preparations for the next 50 years, it has an integrated governance framework to ensure the UAE has the talent and skill available to progress its ambition to achieve presence and excellence in specialized fields. 
The UAE is ranked as a leader in the field of youth empowerment. It recognizes the need to invest in young people and provide them with opportunities to excel. For example, in 2017, it established a national network of youth councils to ensure young people can represent their views and advocate their needs at all stages of government decision making. In 2018, we created the Federal Institution for Youth to ensure young people are at the center of policy development. In 2016, Her Excellency Shamma al Mazrui was appointed Minister of State for Youth Affairs, and at the age of 22, she was the youngest government minister in the world. All these steps represent our will and commitment to secure youth sit at the heart of legislative and executive action. Through these measures, young people are key partners and actors in our efforts and vision for the next 50 years. Arab countries across the region now look to the UAE for guidance in developing their own strategies. The UAE has secured a reputation as a model for economic security, attractiveness to business, and social well being. It is a reputation of which we are very proud. The process of attracting talent must go hand in hand with the process of discovering, motivating, and developing Emirati talent. Therefore, it is essential that we empower our national youth and enhance their knowledge and skills in all fields. This challenge lies first and foremost with the education system and its universities, think tanks, and research institutions. Schools and universities are the cradle for nurturing talent, for developing basic and advanced skills, and maximizing the potential of future generations. These institutions build both knowledge and the values necessary for wise application of knowledge in practical situations. It is also necessary to establish research centers and engage young people in them so that their imagination and bright ideas coincide with those who have extensive theoretical and practical experience. Universities are the engine for sustainable development and the knowledge society. They are the place where our national youth are trained and enabled to innovate, create, and transform ideas into programs of research and applied practice that seek to improve social and economic well being. Universities need to identify practices that are effective in building partnerships between themselves as the academic sector and the public and private sectors. Through this triple helix system, young people grow through a productive encounter with education, ethics, and entrepreneurship. We must provide financial incentives to universities to stimulate research and public-private partnerships, to encourage entrepreneurship and startup programs, and to promote training in research, leadership, and management. Our postgraduate students should be enabled to participate in international exchanges with researchers and research institutions and to interact with the private sector. We look to universities to participate with think tanks and research institutes in the establishment of internships and talent development initiatives. Such programs will enable young people to interact with senior researchers and thought leaders and to develop awareness of what is required to work in policy development. Young people will have the opportunity to develop qualitative and quantitative research skills and to grow to understand how research informs policy making. Your work at this forum is therefore of the utmost importance. Thank you for inviting me to address you at the beginning of your session.
I wish you all the success in your endeavors to secure youth empowerment and to develop their skills in research and innovation. I look forward to hearing of your strategies to ensure young people are positioned to contribute to the development of the future of their own countries. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Excellency, thanks a lot for those words of support and encouragement. Your presence here is not just a matter of pride for us. It also demonstrates the level of support and commitment we have received from the UAE government in all our events and programs. We now move to the President's panel, which revolves around the challenges facing think tanks worldwide when it comes to hiring and retaining talent. In this session, we are featuring a panel of CEOs from every region of the world to explore the challenges think tanks face in recruiting scholars and executives that help them remain on the cutting edge. Chaired by Dr. James McGann, the director of Think Tanks Civil Societies Program, this session comprises the following panelists. Tomiko Ichikawa, Director General of the Japan Institute of International Affairs, and Dr. Samir Saran, President of the Observer Research Foundation, whom are both joining us virtually. Andreas Kramer, Founder and Chairman of the Ecologic Institute, Germany. Dr. Hamad Ibrahim Abdullah, Executive Director of Dirasat Bahrain. And Dr. Charles Powell, Director of Elcano Royal Institute, Spain. I now invite the chair and panelists to take the stage, please. Tamiko and Samir, I'm very pleased to see you uh, as we embark on the first segment of the program. Uh, it is not, with great trepidation when you're doing a hybrid model uh, that everything works and it is uh, wonderful and gratifying to see you. I, our other panelists are already here. Uh, and since it is um, late for, for you, I will go in the order. And since our Master of Ceremonies has introduced everyone, I will um, dispense with introductions. Uh, and I will first uh, turn to you, Tomiko. Jaya uh, is the Japan Institute for International Affairs. Uh, in Japan, uh, and Tomiko, uh, the objective is for each of the panelists to give us a perspective from the uh, chief executive officer at a range of institutions around the world. What are the challenges faced in terms of recruiting, retaining the best and brightest and the next generation of think tank scholars and executives? So without further ado, Tomiko, please. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and first, I'd, I'd just like to just to say how much I'm honored and delighted to be part of this uh, panel with such a distinguished members at such a distinguished forum. Before starting my points, can I ask Jim just a short question because our session is slightly shorter than the probably original schedule, how long should I talk right now? I would say diplomatically as long as you want, uh, but eight minutes. <laughs> right. I'd try to limit myself to within eight minutes or even less. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum and to this such a distinguished panel. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I can cover all the questions that you asked. But I'd like to mention maybe three types of challenges that we face at the Japan Institute of International Affairs, and then four ways to address them very briefly. Three challenges. Actually, I think this is not unique to us at Japan Institute of International Affairs, but more or less common to independent think tanks in Japan, except for those uh, that can rely on the wealth of the particular company or foundation, which are not many. And I think some of the points that I'm going to mention may be also common to some think tanks around the world. So I'll just dive into three challenges. 
Challenge number one in Japan, including ours, most, most think tanks have relatively small number of staff members, including researchers, and do not have clear career paths for their entire career, which means that for internal staff, there are certain seniorities among them, but there is kind of no lifelong career development as they can expect in the case of universities, where, for example, the researchers can start as assistant and to become assistant professor, full professor, dean, etc. There is no such career path. Mm. And also, without any disrespect to all our my male uh, panelists, uh, traditionally, many of the Japanese academia is male dominated, even in social science, although the situation is changing rapidly. That is challenge number one. Challenge number two, uh, traditionally also, there is no so-called revolving door between the government service and academia in Japan. So there is some efforts to increase mobility in both directions, but it's not systematic, which means that most researchers that we are trying to recruit or retain are from long-term academic background without government service or business experience. So they remain in academy. That is a challenge number two. Challenge number three, uh, there is a strong academic tradition to value expertise in narrowly defined areas. But today, policy-related or policy-oriented research needs to be uh, more and more interdisciplinary. For example, uh, when we, you, we discuss US-China relations, we cannot limit our agenda to only policy, political area, or security, military, like traditional ones. We have to cover high-tech, climate, or COVID, all these areas to discuss US-China relations. And for example, when we discuss the Indo-Pacific region, which is a kind of very trendy word, we need to look at regions coming from US to Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, to of course, Middle East and Eastern Africa. And also thematic areas have to be covered very widely. So this is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. So how to address these three challenges? We have not found any magic formula or fundamental solutions, but we are trying to address these challenges in various ways. I just mentioned four here very briefly. Uh, how to address challenges number one. Uh, first, we have been strongly encouraging interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations within our internal researchers and also uh, between research groups and outside experts. For example, we start to issue strategic annual report, which is now JAYA's flagship publication. More and more, it is becoming interdisciplinary, kind of making our researchers need to collaborate with each other, not just focusing on their narrowly defined area. That is one. How to address challenge number two. Uh, we are making sure that our staff including researchers understand what their career path may be in the Institute and what possibilities they have outside and try to encourage them to establish their own contacts and skills. So we encourage them to actually, as I do today, to participate in many outside events to expand their contacts, develop their careers and skills so that they may be able to find other ways after maybe some years with us to further develop their career in other institutions or particularly in universities. And how to address challenges number three. Uh, we are making these years very conscious effort to nominate young researchers and female researchers for various research project groups and ad hoc events. And in particular in uh, new and interdisciplinary areas. Uh, well, we are facing double challenges here because we have relatively small number of female researchers in general in Japan and even more limited number of staff, or oh, sorry, even more limited number of researchers when 
we have to make sure that they are fluent in English, not only to make speeches, but to engage in discussions. My last point, number four, uh, how to address challenges, number four. Actually, COVID-19 forced us to find a way to work in a more flexible way and a more efficient way. We have been conducting so many online meetings. We, est we established from scratch the whole infrastructure to work from home. So, which means uh, our staff, our researchers have to learn different skill sets, new way to do the work, but at the same time, they have more flexibility in their work. And actually this is becoming rather popular with our staff members and researchers about that strategy, uh, about that strategy, uh, flexibility. And in doing all of this, again, without any disrespect respect to my female, uh, my male panel colleagues, I find that having female staff at senior level, including myself, makes a difference in kind of trying to find new ways and not limited, not being limited ourselves in the traditional established ways. I stop here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Tamiko, thank you very much. Uh, a number of issues uh, are now on the table. It's uh, wonderful. I encourage uh, the participants in the audience uh, to think of questions that you want to ask. And for those who are with us virtually uh, to uh, put your questions in the chat and we will hopefully uh, get to them. We will have a round of um, presentations by the panel and then some follow-up questions and then some questions for uh, the audience. Uh, Samir Saran is president of the Observer Research Foundation. Samir? Uh, thank you, Jim, and uh, congratulations to both uh, the Trends Institute and to you for putting this together. And clearly, you are brave and fearless for making that trip across the Atlantic uh, and hosting this very important gathering at this time. I'm uh, sorry I was not able to join you in person, but hope to be at one of your events soon. Uh, let me uh, start by first uh, uh, reflecting on what the pandemic has taught us about human resources, human capital, and think tanks. Uh, my simple uh, one-line uh, summary would be that think tanks now need to have soul. They need to be a great place to work. Uh, if all of us are going to be working from the screens and are going to be working from home and are going to be digitally separate, uh, connected, we will have to offer a unique proposition to be that special place people want to work in. Being on a screen is something that any institution can offer any individual. We will have to offer something more. And I think the pandemic tells us that we have to be institutions that care. We need to care for our resources. We need to uh, ensure that they are looked after. We need to give them assurances that we stand together. And uh, certainly uh, institutions that cared during the pandemic for the workforce uh, are institutions that have done well. Uh, you were right in suggesting, Jim, that um, adaptation to technology was important and think, think tanks that had done it uh, did well. But I would also suggest think tanks which were deeply connected and were like families and were like communities also survived and worked together and, and were able to uh, navigate these choppy waters, in fact, are still navigating these choppy waters. So we need to be institutions with a soul. And it is uh, important that uh, uh, head of institutions, presidents, CEOs, uh, essentially imagine themselves as HR managers. Today, our job is not to manage office buildings and infrastructure and hardware and uh, budgets and expenses of travels and hotels. It is to keep the human motivated. It is to keep the human capital nourished. It is to keep them in their best form. And we all, the first suggestion is, if we have to retain and attract talent, we have to imbibe new skills. We have to learn to work in a very different world. And we have to relate to people at a very different level to be able uh, to engage with the teams that are working at distant locations. The second, the work from home experience and uh, the digital experience suddenly opens up the market space. Uh, each talent in each of our geographies is available to anyone around the world. 
and therefore you are now no longer competing only to hire talent from an indian pool for an indian organization but actually from an indian pool which is being attracted by the global organizations and therefore you have to think global you can no longer be a, a, a national institution anymore you have to you are part of a much larger pool and you are uh, uh, able to tap into talent that is uh, in distant lands and talent closer to your uh, geography is going to be uh, 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 embraced by others and therefore uh, whether we like it or not we are all global institutions now we are competing in the global marketplace of ideas and human capital is a global resource we will have to make offerings that are globally attractive and i mean salaries i mean work conditions i mean care i mean support and i mean opportunities so in some sense uh, uh, we are no longer uh, indian institutions uh, in uh, jim mcgann's table but we are now global institutions in that first list that jim comes out with even when we compete for human resources so i think that is something that we have to reorient in our own thinking in our own processes in our own institutional architecture if we need to do well in this post pandemic and the ongoing um, uh, uh, period uh, of transition the third the talent that we seek is very different now uh, i think uh, if we are all honest and i can see a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, sitting next to you jim uh, if we are all honest we will admit that we were all incrementalists we were defenders of the order we were in many ways uh, the 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 crafters of the old order and therefore we find it very difficult uh, to uh, in many ways be part of an exercise that is going to demolish some of the old assumptions and incrementalism uh, and think tanks were were deeply interlinked i think think tanks have to be far more bold and far more uh, progressive in embracing disruptions and change and only then will the young energetic talent be attracted to them if we are going to behave like the defenders of the old faith uh, uh, the young that are restless that are uh, in distress that are sometimes angry and that are mostly hungry and aspirational will not be attracted to institutions that are seeking uh, to prevent some of the structural and systemic changes that may be upon us in the coming years and days so think tanks will have to be nifty disruptive institutions themselves and will have to arm themselves with the talent and energy that is going to be part of this new age uh, certainly this new decade which might be quite transformational so transformations require new energy and to attract that new energy you need to be willing to sh shed some of the old shibboleths and embrace some of the new realities that are upon, uh, upon us so our mission statements which were uh, linked at uh, incremental change based on the data and deep research may be in for a bit of a rocking uh, in the post pandemic world and we will have to think about it fourth we were uh, uh, i mean uh, jim you had this meeting 2 years ago and i remember saying this that we have to defend we have to defend research uh, old fashion good deep research is important and i still believe that that is going to continue to be uh, at the core of any think tanks work we will have to uh, dig deep and we will have to come forward with appealing policy propositions based on that deep research we are defenders of Uh, good research that translates into great policies but we will have to communicate it very differently uh, we are no longer in a world where we will have the privilege of sitting in a huddle of 100 people 30 people 70 people and close room meetings and briefings etc etc we will have to find new grammars new tools new mediums to communicate uh, uh, changes in ways that are exciting stimulating and can galvanize uh, uh, a new genre of influencers who are no longer part of your think tank systems or political systems or policy systems but are the greta thunbergs on the street or young activists who have more followers on instagram etc etc you may or you may not disagree with them but you will have to engage with them because they have a voice louder than uh, many others and you will have to get your message to them and getting your message to them requires a whole new grammar which we will have to develop as think tanks and therefore i think the talent that is able to help you deliver these messages is the talent that you should seek to be including in your think tanks of the future you need to be insta friendly you need to be 
um, friendly with all the new mediums that the world communicates in and you have to uh, uh, certainly create a, a format of comms which is different and finally um, uh, jim i know i'm uh, i'm running out of time but i just want to make one more point uh, and finally i think uh, the domains uh, that are uh, exploding that require urgent attention are very different and very new uh, uh, most of those who today manage think tanks and reside in think tanks uh, uh, would never have had to think about lethal autonomous weapon systems and, and emerging technologies and big data and deep fakes and synthetic truth and fake news and everything else in between. Uh, and therefore, when these new domains have emerged on the horizon as the key political policies, society and economic um, challenges, uh, we need a whole new cadre of experts. They necessarily may not reside in universities. They may not come out of public policy schools. They may not go to international relations colleges. We will have to uh, hunt for a whole new cadre of programmers, of thinkers, of, of uh, sociologists, of doctors. Uh, depending on the domains we want to engage with, we will have to hunt for those who understand that domain. And we will have to, in some ways, upskill them so that they can correlate it across disciplines like um, the previous speaker was mentioning. We will have to take a specialist and uh, imbibe him with the skills of a generalist. And we are going to have this new hybrid soldier in think tanks that is going to be able to work across domains. And uh, uh, in many ways, uh, we will have to make this process exciting because every ad agency, every media house, every corporate communication department of the, uh, in the business world, across the world, wants the smartest Indian. And if I want to get that smartest Indian, I'll have to give him an exciting proposition. Uh, I hope <clears throat> that you will stay with us for the remainder of the program. And uh, I'm certain that uh, there are questions already. Um, there are cross-cutting themes in both of your presentations. Uh, one, uh, the importance of uh, creating either in terms of uh, a career path uh, as expressed by Tomiko and Samir in terms of uh, a caring institution, the global dimension, and the fact that we really need to rethink the whole business model, um, both in terms of the external forces, but also in terms of what it means to have a meaningful organization. So. Uh, very rich uh, comments. I appreciate uh, both of your interventions. And I now turn uh, to Andreas from Ecologic. Thank you, Jim. It is a great honor to be here. And thank you to the Trends um, uh, and to the Think Tank and Civil Society program for organizing this. This is a very important topic. As we get out of the worst phase of the pandemic with vaccination rates going up, um, uh, and our eyes focus more on the perennial challenges, on the aggravating challenges that exist in society. And some people may focus on the inequality in the world. I focus on environment, on climate change, which is becoming ever more urgent and more pressing. So I respond to all the things that Tomiko Ishikawa and Samia Saran said. So many things that I fully agree with, so many good things. Um, I respond to that from the position of an environmental think tank, in the north, it's a private think tank, not um, a, a government-sponsored think tank, but we have to compete for our money, which imposes a discipline on us that, uh, and it reduces our strategic options in a way that other think tanks don't have. But our political environment is very positive. The headquarter is in Berlin. And after 16 years of Angela Merkel at the top, our climate chancellor, we are envisaging, after the election in September, a massive change. After 16 years of the same person, of the same parties in government, even if the CDU, our ruling party, will be re-elected, there will be a change of personnel. It will be a change of generation. And Tomiki Ishikawa said, there is no revolving door in Japan. There is no revolving door in um, Germany either but we are heading for a generational turnover. We are heading mm. for the retirement of a whole generation of politicians and the ranks in the political parties, in government, in the ministry administrations have to be replenished. So we expect them to come and recruit from our staff. I expect for the first time 
that we will have a loss of between five and 15 senior staff, senior executives, but also program leaders. Because where do the young pe younger people come from that have enough experience to be able to serve in government, but are young enough in order to be fresh, and that are female, because there is a very strong preference for female candidates, and we have a high number of female senior staff. So for the first time, that is a challenge that we face, and we're preparing for it. And I know that other think tanks in our situation do the same. Everybody is preparing succession, which is difficult to do if you know it might happen, but it can't happen. But in an environment like that, where the Green Party is now considered to be part of the establishment and part of the conservative part of the problem, we now have the emergence of a new political party that wants to put the fire under the Greens and wants to push ambition on climate action in a way that the Green Party just is no longer seen as capable of doing. In a world like that, Ecologic Institute is in demand. The politicians want to know from us how to manage this, the um, uh, transition towards sustainability, what works politically, what doesn't work, what they can learn from other countries, how they can cooperate with other countries. We don't have to go and open doors in order to influence politicians. They come to us, and the same for business people and uh, university leaders. And young people want to work for us. We get more unsolicited applications for jobs than we have places for. So our strategy for recruitment, Jim, is screening and filtering, keeping out the ones that we don't want and picking out the ones that really have promise. Because what you want in a think tank are not people who have streamlined their career, that know today where they want to be in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time. We want people who are ready to meet the demands of the moment, to listen to what society needs, and then find an answer. So rather than finding people who are organizing their career and go through university with good grades, but as fast as possible, we're looking for the people who have a break in their biography. It could be because of their parents moved around too much around the world when they were young and they were sent from one school to another. They got absorbed many different perspectives. It may be that they started studying physics and then became a philosophy teacher. It doesn't matter to us, but they changed direction. They reflected on what they wanted to become. They changed their mind and they showed flexibility. Those are the people that will succeed in the longer run. Um, they will be much better than somebody who has the best PhD of the university of that year. Basically, it is that versatility, that curiosity, that risk-taking ability um, uh, that we're looking for. Um, we do have problems in some areas, and I want to focus on one of them, um, which is IT services and um, web. We all recruit scholars and um, uh, executives, but we also recruit essential professional support staff. And we have difficulties because we can't, with the limitations that we have, we can't pay the sort of salaries that good IT experts and good web designers can command. But we need them in-house. So we need a strategy for getting them. And one of them is we engage in vocational training. We get school leavers that have an interest in learning how to run IT systems, who've been fiddling around with that as children anyway. And they want to learn that. They go to technical college two days a week. They work with us three days a week. And for three years, they get training, practical training from us, theoretical training from the technical college. They have an instructor that helps them with their projects. These instructors become advisors to us. After three years, they have a recognized qualification, recognized by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we can choose to keep them, retain them, or let them go when they will go to another organization where we can contact them for cooperation if we want to at some future point in time. We invest in them as we, we would invest in the scholars. We also invest in scholars. We do that. We recruit many people um, for exchange programs, for career enhancement programs. This is part of the fun of doing the think tank, you placing the bets on young people and then helping them grow. We do that, and that was disrupted to, during the pandemic. Our vocational training was not disrupted in any way. On the contrary, we were able to offer more places, and there were more people taking them up because other organizations, including businesses, 
um, dropped out of that. Um, and the last point I wanted to say is that we focus on recruitment. Um, I have, in my 20 years running Ecologic Institute as the president, I've employed 500 people at the end of it, 150 were still there. I had let to let go of 350 people. And with most of them, we remain in contact. What we do is we place people. If they say we want, they want to move on, we help them find a job, whether that it is in a university, whether they want to go to a ministry, two um, decided to run for parliament, three are now ambassadors or deputy ambassadors. We have placed a lot of people. And you know, you manage the exits from your organization. You compliment people out. It creates an attractive employer because everybody knows that you work for Ecologic Institute, you work for a think tank, and it is not a dead end in your career, but it is actually a springboard for something better. And if you manage your exits in that way, that is an essential part of your, your recruitment strategy. Thank you. Excellent. Um, once again, uh, this session is to sort of raise and foreshadow many of the issues that we will discuss throughout. I want to uh, point out that uh, uh, something that both you and, and Samir said uh, and was a part of the um, Think Tank Innovation Summit, we have one of the comments that stayed with me uh, from that meeting is that, uh, and uh, something that both you and Samir said that uh, sparked it for me is uh, that every think tank should have a resident skeptic or iconoclast. As someone who is challenging not only the, the wisdom and thinking of the institution, but in terms of policies. I mean, really our value added is not reinforcing the policies that exist, but essentially providing constructive criticism um, and advice around key policies. Additionally, in terms of the ecologic, I think is a classic example of the need to rethink, whether it's AI or the environment, that our single disciplinary approach no longer works, that, we, that the problems we face are multidisciplinary and require interdisciplinary research. We now hear from Hamad, who is uh, <coughs> the executive director of Derasad, which is in Bahrain. And I take this opportunity, uh, he's coming to the podium, and while he's doing that, uh, take this opportunity to uh, announce that the 2021, um, I should say, since I'm here, inshallah, that um, will be in December uh, 6th and 7th uh, in Bahrain. The Middle East and Global Summit uh, will be there. In addition, there will be the European Summit uh, in November, which we hope will also be in person. So, Hamid. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies and Honorable Guests, I would like to begin by thanking Trends Research and Advisory in the United Arab Emirates and the Think Tanks and Civil Societies Program at the University of Pennsylvania for hosting this important event. Dear guests, think tanks are not a new phenomenon, as they have always been closely tied to international relations. The RAND Corporation, for example, was founded in 1948, funded by the US Air Force, and has been managing very important research projects ever since, demonstrating an exceptional support for American decision makers in understanding the policies of rivals and opponents and the case is similar with other intellectual organizations later established. If we take a look at the current intellectual map of those think tanks, we will find more than 7,000 of them worldwide. Despite their mandates and scope of work, some handle various political, economic, security, and defense issues. Others focus on specific areas. Overall, think tanks are bound by three common attributes. First, providing comprehensive views of issues and challenges supplemented with statistics and evidence that support decision makers by way of policy papers, which contain options for specific policy decisions due to the efforts of the specialized research teams involved. Second, launching and assessing new policies prior to enactment such as official policies after extensive discussions 
among decision makers, researchers, and experts, brainstorming for debatable issues. Third, independent work as research is conducted without partisan or interest-based tendencies, therefore ensuring high objectivity. Your Excellencies and Honorable Guests, one of the most important challenges facing think tanks globally is empowering youth and striving to maximize their potential while providing them with the necessary guidance. Thus, allow me to share our experience at the Bahrain Center for Strategic International and Energy Studies de Rasat in the Kingdom of Bahrain in this field. We at the center have always implemented a policy of enabling youth as one of the most important priorities to the center in order for them to reach their maximum potential. We also have taken the initiative to reach out to promising youth who, will, who we will believe will be an important addition in the field of studies and research in Bahrain, either by means of employment or by providing them with internships. At Durasat, we also provide extensive training to our research staff that would assist them in the process of developing their skills while encouraging them to come up with innovative solutions. Furthermore, the center has funded a number of its researching staff to further the studies abroad, assisting them financially in gaining their PhDs. In addition to has been what has been presented so far, the center has signed a number of memoranda of understanding with universities, thus assisting in the process of exchanging expertise and have encouraged youth working in academia to present their papers and findings in conferences and webinars organized by the center. In relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, we at Durasat have learned to seize the challenges and turn them into opportunities. We have thus utilized our scholars and launched joint work with the United Nations Development Program to study the socio-economic impact of COVID-19 in Bahrain through a series of initiatives that were brought forward by promising youth working at the center. The result was a wide range of exceptional studies and reports in the field, some of which, for example, measured the physical and mental well-being and role of telemedicine during the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic on the private sector, a detailed assessment of the socio-economic impact of the pandemic locally, how it affected financial transa transactions and consumer behavior, remote working, the impact of the pandemic on women in Bahrain, and the study of the effects of the global challenge on the environment in Bahrain. In addition to a wide range of other reports and opinion polls related to the matter, moreover, we at Durasat dedicated our third annual forum to the topic, as we titled it, The Role of Think Tanks in Supporting national efforts combating the coronavirus pandemic as an example. All these efforts were made possible through the center's youthful research and study staff who worked diligently during these challenging times. This proves the positive contribution of youth in the fields of study and research. Such activities raise the profile and reputation of Durasat on a global scale based on the global go-to think tank index maintained annually by the Think Tank and Civil Societies Program at the University of Pennsylvania, where Durasat Center achieved a 19th rank advancement in two years, reaching the 23rd place in MENA region in 2020, and the seventh place in the Arabian Gulf region in the same year, from 11th back in 2018. This competitive progress among hundreds of global think tanks was the result of successful framework and effort. Fellow participants and honorable guests, Given the importance or important role of the think tanks, not only in supporting decision makers, but also as the state's soft power, they face numerous challenges. And if I may sum them in five main challenges. Number one, funding. Despite the allocated budgets for independent think tanks, and given their mission of releasing periodic publications and reports and organizing events, they most likely require more funding. Number two, the quickening pace of regional and global events, the developments of which change think tank plans and the COVID-19 pandemic is a primary example. Third, the need for think tanks to work in a comprehensive and unified vision under holistic research umbrella. Fourth, 
the limitation of forward-looking studies compared to historical or contemporary ones. Forward-looking studies are particularly important in setting the course for priorities, options, and alternatives to support decision makers. Fifth, the lack of socio uh, social awareness regarding the importance of think tanks, perhaps due to their relatively recent presence, despite their growing role as a complete knowledge source. Last but not least, we all agree that the fast-paced and intertwined developments we are all witnessing all leave all countries in urgent need for developing think tank research agendas to suit the necessity imposed by these developments. Thank you very much. Hamid, thank you very much. Um, uh, your reference early in your presentation of RAND um, for me brings uh, an important point uh, that I think we need to focus on. Each period uh, in terms of the research that I've done um, because of either a domestic or international upheaval ushered in a new generation of think tanks, RAND after World War II, to harness, the basic objective was uh, one, to harness the energy that was put into uh, developing military technology into a broader use. Deve and from that, develop a whole new type of institution. RAND has its own school of public policy to train um, their um, uh, scholars uh, and analysts, more analysts uh, in terms of both analyst and scholar, um, in that, and it's important, and I, it raises for me the question, what is the model, the new business model? And for this panel toward the end, what are the elements, the core elements of the uh, think tank of the future? I am very pleased uh, to introduce Charles Powell from uh, Eclano, the Royal Institute from Spain, uh, to make uh, the final presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim often asks me to speak last. I'm beginning to think this is not such a friendly <laughs> gesture as I once thought. Uh, but let me just say what a great honor and a pleasure it is to be in this breathtakingly vibrant city of Dubai. It's wonderful to be back in the Emirates. And thank you uh, and your team for your invitation and our hosts at Trends for their wonderful hospitality and organizational skills. Um, Right at the beginning of, of uh, your introduction, Jim, you asked us to hover above this ever-changing scenario at a distance of about 50,000 feet. And I'd like you to take you up on that in the sense that I, would, I think it's important for all of us to uh, take a step back and take some time to think and, and rethink um, what think tanks are all about. A colleague of mine in the US, a very prominent female think tank uh, CEO, um, has suggested, for example, that we stop using the term think tank. She doesn't like this term because we do more than just think. We act, or at least we should. And secondly, she finds the term tank um, slightly off-putting because tanks are enclosed spaces by definition. And she has offered an alternative which she herself acknowledges is probably not going to gain much tra traction, and that is change hub. And I like this notion, although I'm not sure it's very catchy, uh, because of course we are all involved in change and dealing with change. Even conservatives, by the way, are involved in change because they want to change things back to the way they used to be, or the way they think they used to be more often. And hub, of course, is a brilliant term because it stresses something that this room is the best possible evidence of, and that is the interconnectedness of the think tank community. So it's a wonderful pleasure, once again, to be involved in this global conversation about think tanks. And I also want to stress something else, and that is that I very much need to believe that there is a silver lining in this dreadful COVID-19 cloud that we have all been living under. What do I mean by this? Well, I think that 
uh, the pandemic and its consequences. And by the way, this will not be the last pandemic. We already knew that, but now we really have to start taking this possibility far more seriously than we have hitherto. The pandemic has uh, changed our lives. It's changed our personal lives, and it's also changed our professional lives. And this is um, the point I really want to make this afternoon, and that is that um, we should take advantage of this opportunity to rethink our institutions internally, how we function as organizations, placing our staff at the heart of the institution. I know this sounds you know, rhetorical and wishful thinking and so on, but I think the pandemic has woken us up to the fact that we are nothing without a happy, productive staff. Um, and this, I think, has actually completely changed my attitude as a think tank executive. Uh, Jim very kindly described us as mature leaders in his introduction, which I guess means we're old and we should retire. Um, and I'm coming to terms with that myself gradually. But the, the, the important point is, um, you know, how is this pandemic really going to change our attitude towards human resources? Uh, how is the pandemic going to change our attitude um, to the way we deal with, with um, a lot of the internal issues that already existed? So my first answer to this, and I have recently lived through the recruitment of six staff members, two executives and four scholars, is first of all, we have had to professionalize our human resource management very significantly. I'm almost ashamed to tell you that although we are a 20-year-old institution with an annual budget of about, about 5 million euros and 50 staff in Madrid and, and, and Brussels, we did not have a human resources director. Why? Because I suppose many of the executives at El Cano are scholars, and we believed that you know, scholars are clever enough to manage these things without having to institutionalize them. Big mistake. This is something I have learned during the pandemic. So we have professionalized this. Uh, we have headhunted a new um, head of human resources who is in turn helping us uh, to deal with a lot of the issues that I've been um, discussing. When it comes to recruitment, the second thing we've done is to be far more uh, systematic and targeted when it comes to the use of social media um, because that is the audience that we need to um, address if we are going to re recruit the youngest and the brightest. And in connection th with this, given that there are hundreds of and thousands of brilliant young Spaniards who've um, done their PhDs abroad in the States, other parts of Europe, uh, in Latin America, elsewhere in the world, we are appealing to the Spanish diaspora. In other words, we are recruiting um, all over the world to try to bring back this talent which our country has uh, exported over the years, and I think we, we owe it to them. It's part of our social responsibility as Spain's most important uh, and largest think tank. Um, the challenges that we all face have already been discussed. Funding is obviously an import, uh, a very important one, and with that comes the need to provide competitive salaries. How can we as think tanks offer these bright young scholars truly competitive um, salaries when there is so much competition out there from consultancy firms, from private sector companies, from European institutions. You know, the European Commission, European Parliament pay extremely uh, good salaries and provide wonderful uh, job security. And I think the only answer I can offer to that is by offering our staff much more meaningful careers. Um, Samir used the, referred to the fact that we need to gain or strengthen the soul, the, the soulfulness, if you like, of our institutions. This is something we really have to take very seriously. And this basically means two or three things. First of all, um, expanding our field of operations, expanding our research projects to make them truly, truly relevant and attractive. And that, in our case, we are a generalist IR institution. This basically means that we're paying much more attention to issues such as energy, climate change, and the technological revolution. These are very important themes in themselves, but above all, they are the themes that young scholars tend to feel more passionate about. 
we have to introduce uh, new technologies within uh, our institutions. We talk about um, artificial intelligence and we should begin to learn how to use artificial intelligence within our own institutions much more than we have been doing. Much more friendly working environments. And this has all sorts of implications uh, in aspects such as um, gender issues but also to provide a more equitable environment. I'm fascinated to notice, Jim, that Brookings, an institution we all admire, has recently acquired a trade union. Isn't that a wonderfully revolutionary 21st century concept? The staff at Brookings are unionizing. Now, I don't necessarily want to set the cat among the pigeons here. I can see some worried faces already, but only seven or eight percent of these U.S. staff who work in third sector institutions are unionized. And if the young scholars at Brookings are unionizing, this is very worrying and troubling to me. This suggests that there is something deeply wrong with our institutions or institutions like ours, which the pandemic has probably brought to the surface um, more clearly than ever before. Um, in other words, therefore, you know, we are thinking, I'm thinking really quite hard about how to offer our staff a more meaningful uh, professional um, career. And finally, and of course that includes a, a more satisfactory work-life balance. And finally, um, Jim referred to this and so did Andreas, our mottos should really be renew or die. Um, it's really about institutional self-preservation. Good think tanks, like good organizations, I would imagine, in any walk of life, need to uh, offer, if you like, intergenerational variety, intergenerational pluralism. We need older people. Normally, they tend to uh, end up at the top of the pyramid, organizational pyramid, and we constantly need to renew um, this generational pyramid by bringing in young blood. And this, I think, is more urgent than ever now. First of all, because these young people really do have skills that we oldies do not have. I'm talking basically about two kinds of skills, tech and communications. These skills come naturally to this younger generation, and it would be absur uh, absurd not to profit from that. And secondly, as most importantly, and I'll conclude here, the point that Andreas was making, um, and that Jim was making as well, it's not just one iconoclast um, or, or one person who should uh, constantly challenge the received wisdoms on which we have been relying so long, for so long. All of our young people to have to be iconoclasts to some extent. They, if we really want to them to think out, outside the box and produce original thinking. And to conclude, we didn't see this coming, okay? We did not see this coming. Uh, we theorized about it. It's present in a lot of national security strategies, but we as think tankers failed to act on this. And I think our younger generations are very much aware of that and they will hold us to account. Thank you very much. I'm going to pose a question for the panelists and give them some time to respond. Uh, and then I'm going to, uh, prior to their answering the question, open it up from questions from uh, the audience since uh, you have been listening and uh, it's been a very rich discussion. Uh, so I'd want to give you the opportunity to, to raise some questions for the panel or just generally. Uh, a question should be in the form of a question, not a speech, uh, and should be brief and, and to the point. Um, but first I want to um, touch on something that um, was mentioned in, in terms of our first panelist, uh, which is the revolving door. Um, I think traditionally, and, and I, I want to clarify what is the revolving door, it's a, something that is deeply embedded in the American political system and think tank landscape, where individuals seamlessly move from think tanks into government and then back again. And generally, um, and what I would suggest uh, building um, on uh, Tomiko's uh, observation uh, is that we should have a broader view of the revolving door, meaning that it should not be just scholars who go into government and then back 
to a think tank, but we really need to look at a broader set of professions that really help meet the new challenges we face. One of the things that's happening as a result of changes in the marketplace for journalists is that large numbers of journalists have now migrated to think tanks, which has been very productive for think tanks. So one of, you know, one of the most successful is a, a gentleman named S Steve Weissman, who was a, a journalist for the New York Times and had the unenviable job of moving to the Peterson Institute for International Economics and to, God forbid, have economists make sense out of what they've written for the general public, which was not an easy task, but has been incredibly effective in helping transform the organization. We also need people from tech companies and others. So I think a broader sense of what Kamiko has raised of helping institutionalize in our institutions to help transform them as has been presented. And so for, th for the panelists in uh, giving you time to prepare, what are, what is the new mo business model for think tanks? And what are the key positions that think tanks should have, one, to help them transform, help th them to remain competitive uh, in this new, highly competitive, information-rich, which has not been mentioned, environment in which we all now m must operate? And so I open it now for some questions. <coughs> um, I don't know if we have mo uh, mics. Do we have a mic? And if you could identify yourself and your affiliation. My name is Omar al Abedli from Dirasat. That's my boss is on the <laughs> stage. Um, this is a question actually potentially to you more than anyone, Jim. Uh, I wasn't intending that to happen. But <laughs> because, you, because you're a... I said the panelists. I just want to clarify. Yes. Uh, <laughs> because you work at a university and, and a think tank. Um, one... One trend uh, that I've noticed in knowledge institutions is that uh, administrative uh, also elements of the organization tend to grow uh, at a faster rate than the researchers. Uh, and this is bad for young researchers in two ways. One is it swallows up resources that would be used to hire, and Charles mentioned you know, in competitive salaries. And one of the reasons you can't give competitive salaries is because all these HR and finance and so on, people tend to uh, uh, need high salaries. And secondly, because, and this is something from my own experience as a professor in a university, is that these administrators tend to create uh, bureaucratic work for the young researchers. Uh, as an assistant professor, I had to fill out all sorts of forms and uh, uh, go through quality assurance exercises and so on, which would not be present if researchers were uh, running the show as they, as they wanted. Uh, so what's the, uh, and, and I think this tends to happen as, as an aside because it's easy to pr measure researchers' output, but it's difficult to measure administrators' output, so then they can be more effective in expanding their bureaucratic reach. Anyway, the question is to the panel and to you perhaps more than anyone, Jim, is how do you stop that from happening? How do you stop this bureaucratic creep uh, and this inflation of the non-research elements of the organization at the expense of the research elements, which then therefore hires, <laughs> harms the long-term quality of uh, the research department. Thank you. So um, one, uh, and I have to be, you know, delicate here since I'm at a university, um, is uh, I always, when someone comes to me and says, I want to start a think tank, what are things that I uh, should do? And my advice in answering your question is um, at, I mean, near a university, but not at a university uh, because of the cultural differences and the drag that it creates um, is, is highly problematic and uh, reduces the effectiveness in many respects of uh, the institution for the reason you mentioned because they're doing more paperwork than that. But in terms of more specifically in response, um, I think you can't make generalizations about uh, other staff other than researchers because the reality of which, you know, I firmly believe, one, ideas will always be the central and most important part, and innovative ideas of, of think tanks. And I say, 
every institution is only good as its last good idea. Um, and so you have to keep them coming. Uh, but, you know, as I al as al have also said, that um, think tanks must innovate and die. And part of the innovation is administrative efficiencies, communications, and technology. The reality is that AI may make all of us irrelevant because you can now essentially search, if you're a lawyer, for the, mo for the most effective argument for the case, specific case that you are uh, arguing that has prevailed most frequently. And so why do you need a legal assistant or a junior lawyer if AI will do that? I think we all have to think about that because pencil pushers are going to be coming to the same conclusion. And we have to understand what's the value added. And more importantly, and in response to your question, how do we harness technology to increase our analytical ability? And how do we effectively argue that and present that? That will be and be able to do what Steve Weissman does at P Peterson Institute for International Economics. How do you make complex things, not dumb them down, but make them accessible and, and make them in a way that brings about change that will make people's lives better? So I, you know, I agree and understand what you're saying about researchers, but the, the, the organizations that will survive will have the right mix in terms of the business model that we will hopefully hear about in a second um, to address that. And they have to be lean, mean policy machines in some respect. There were other questions over here? And then we'll come back. And, and then uh, Abla, yeah, right. Well, uh, possession of the mic is nine tenths of the law. So Abla, please ask your question while we're waiting. Um, okay. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Andrea Tanco. I'm from the Migration Policy Institute. Andrew Sealy sends his regards. Um, so my question is, one of the challenges that we face is most foundations and sponsorship wants to target the funding for the initiatives or for the research. So the challenge is to find funding so that we can support our general operations or the development of talent, of internships, etc. So I would love for the panelists to just Tell us a little bit more of what models are they uh, formulating so that we can have more funding for these um, extra activities or extra, um, yeah, extracurriculars almost that are not in, focusing on the in, research per se. In, in the sake of time, I would just ask one, unless another panelist has a, uh, uh, a overriding desire to jump in, if one of you could just address it. I, through gesticulation, Andreas, it seemed that you were Thank you. Um, I said earlier that we professionalized certain activities like IT. This is something we did also for human resources, for event management, um, for a number of other support functions. And it actually helped us keep the scholars happier because they didn't have to bother, waste their time on the things that they're not good at. Um, and they had professional support where it mattered. As a consequence of that, we have a relatively high visible cost of all the things that are not scholarly we have a fairly high level of cost for general expenses, as you would call them. And the practice has been to do two things. One is to make that transparent and explicit and associate that to the different programs and to the institute as a whole. And then to make that transparent to our funders and basically say, if you want to employ a scholar, an analyst, a communicator, a political whisperer through us, you must pay for the support staff. There is an overhead associated with it. Otherwise, we don't take your money. The surprising thing is that most people, once they explained the link and the utility of that general expense, they agree to cover it. Okay, next. Um, and then in the back from our young scholars. Yes, well, the young one is definitely right. more we're, important. We, we are, we'll hear because of nine-tenths of the law is possession, and since Abla has the mic. I, I did not have it. It was delivered to me. I didn't make any effort to take it. <laughs> but, but we will hear first from uh, a okay. mature think tank executive. Yeah. And then mature from is the not next a nice word. I mean, <laughs> just, just said that. 
<laughs> but yours is, not, yours is not a nice idea. We will hear from a think tank, another think tank executive from the region. Yeah, Abla. That, that's much better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Abla Abdelatif, uh, uh, Executive Director of the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies. I want to thank all panelists for excellent, very inspiring uh, comments. I have a specific question actually for Andreas. Uh, um, um, and, and it's revolving around the idea of, the, again, the revolving door and the career path uh, for everybody that's working in the think tanks. You said that you manage, better manage the exits, okay, and you encourage people to move to other jobs and so on. How do you manage the gap in the think tanks after these guys leave? Because there is an accumulation of knowledge. And then you have all your senior big people leaving. Then you, you have actually a bunch of juniors. How, how do you manage that? I just want to know about your yeah. experience here. Uh, and then uh, one general question for all about social media. How do you communicate um, from your experience, okay? You communicate your research through social media. Which channel is the most um, uh, interesting one? Because the way you communicate through the social media varies. The type of researches that we do are heavy, okay? And so communicating them to the public is not actually very easy. So what is your experience there? Thank okay. you. Uh, the the young end. guy in the back. Mike. Whenever somebody leaves, it's best to know early in the process and make sure that the people who work with them in the teams, project teams, program teams, they also know. Because whenever somebody goes, it provides opportunities for others in the organization to make a career jump. And that is the transition. Being willing to hand over your knowledge, your contacts, your assessment, um, and making sure that it is understood. Um, Part of that is knowledge management, um, making sure that the knowledge is always shared in the team, but also between the scholar and the finance department, for example, for the contractual side of it. Yes, you always lose something, but you also win something. And it's a balance, and on the whole, it is unavoidable that people leave. There's a question of how you do it so that it causes least harm for you, yourself, for the team structure, for the contact with the clients, with the sponsors, with the supporters, with the external partners that we have, sharing the contacts. That's the most important thing, and that's best done in team structures. Timiko, could you talk about, in, in, in connecting um, Abla's question uh, to something you said about uh, that you actively, since there's not much chance for mobility within Jaya for researchers, you have said you encourage um, and your staff to essentially and provide opportunities for them to network and engage. Uh, I ask you, uh, you don't want to be too successful in that, uh, I would think. I mean, that, you're, that it creates, that if you're encouraging your staff to, through networks that they may leave, how do you manage that in a way that, you know, gives them the opportunity as a caring environment, but you know, doesn't create major disruptions in the way that uh, it seems that Andreas has indicated that they manage. So how do you manage that? Yeah, okay, in our case, it may be a bit different in the sense that we at Jaya, from the beginning, do not exp expect these researchers to remain at Jaya throughout their career. Because as I explained, we are rather a small organization. We don't have much advancement. So we encourage people to find their own careers. But the good thing is that, as I think Andreas also said, we retain good terms with them. Some of them, which departed Jaya, became professors at some universities are now participating in our research projects as external experts. Mm. And we are very proud of them because they started as kind of young researchers with us, but they grew and they became full professor and they are contributing from their knowledge to our current work. And just to answer also female question from someone uh, outside, I think it's important for male or female researchers to make themselves indispensable with their own knowledge, own expertise. So male or female, for me, throughout my career, I always made it possible for my career because I had some special knowledge. And actually now I'm doing both management currently and research kind of director. So by combining these two abilities, I'm also economizing some of the resources that we are talking about and having a broad overview of the operational aspect and administrative aspect and research aspect at the same time. 
it was one of the changes that actually my uh, boss, uh, Ambassador Sasai, made specifically so that I can oversee all the aspects of the Institute, which helped us a lot to go through these drastic changes under COVID. Thank you. And, uh, and who would like to connect the uh, social media to the, to the sort of new business model and staffing? Since we're talking about uh, recruiting and retaining younger people, partly, this is part of our conversation, you know, we try, we, we're trying everything, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I think it's important to have your own YouTube channel. By the way, again, let me find a silver lining in this cloud. The number of people who follow us uh, as an institute has doubled during the pandemic. Um, and we also found something very interesting, which is that we have more female followers and we have younger followers. We're assuming that this is because um, younger female our younger female audience it doesn't always feel terribly you know, happy or uh, comfortable about attending events, formal events, which are largely dominated by older males, right? So this has been a very interesting and very positive development. Uh, we've also internationalized our audience. We, have, we now have more followers outside Spain than in Spain. In fact, outside Europe than within Europe. Most of our followers are now in the US and in Latin America, um, interestingly. But I, I think, you know, we, we, th there are a lot of articles and studies out there about social media. My advice would, would be to, you know, spread it out um, because different na cultures, different nationalities and different age groups have different uh, tastes. You know, um, I've become a, a Twitter freak. I, I tweet all day long. It's driving my family up the wall. Um, and, you know, only seven or eight years ago, I hated the damn thing. But I, I find it a very, very useful instrument for the dissemination of our research and our work. And this is actually now how I keep up to date with what other think tanks and colleagues are doing all over the world. Hmm. And uh, yeah, quickly, yeah, yeah. Regards to social media, uh, as my colleague has mentioned, that we need to spread out uh, the platforms and try to utilize as many platforms as possible, and uh, also invite scholars, whether within the institution or outside the institution, to give presentations or to give their work or papers or present uh, various topics. And that has helped a lot because what they would do is that they would spread the news and there and wherever they work in the, the institution that they work in or the organization or the university that, look, I am giving a presentation at uh, Dirasat or any other organization and uh, it's going to be live on YouTube or it's going to be live uh, on on uh, on Facebook or uh, Twitter or what have you, so that would prompt them to join in, and that would also uh, enhance the 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 number of followers. Uh, and also, it depends from one region to another. For example, Instagram is very popular in Bahrain. Uh, Twitter might be uh, popular in other parts of the world. For example, in the United States. So it varies from one region to another. So spreading, diversifying is a key element, and also spreading the word. You know, sometimes it's even by people you know, you know, some, so uh, that, that's pretty much very, very effective in this dimension. So thank you so much. Wonderful. We now have a question in the back from the next generation of think tank scholars and executives. Table. Good evening, everyone. First, thanks um, a lot for all the panelists, for all the- P Please identify yourself and your affiliation. Sure. Um, my name is Ali al Janaywi from Trends Research and Advisory. And I want to go back to thank the panelists again for the amazing uh, information we had today. Um, I think um, the youth are grabbing, uh, we're grabbing all the attention today, so we're very happy about it, especially female. Um, my question, like in general for all the panelists, I want to point out the fact that we live in an exponential era of knowledge, technological revolution, especially AI. Uh, how can we deal with this huge amount of information and how can we anticipate the future in a state of uncertainty? Um, is it as easy as it sounds? Well, I will, I will um, not, I'm not often as an IR professor citing Henry Kissinger, uh, but Henry Kissinger um, said that being a policymaker, and this 
may not be a reference that crosses cultures well, but being a policymaker is like being at the end of a fire hose. And if you don't know what a fire hose is, it's a high pressure flow of water and, so much the, and it's so much that you can't deal with it. I think that we are all now at the end of a fire hose. And part of the challenge as institutions we face is how do you break through the noise? How do you um, communicate effectively the core issues? Uh, because there's so much information and it's not, and it's not just in the policy arena. You know, think about, every, you know, if you're going traveling or buying a book, there are 30 people telling you that they're the best, they've got the best deal. How do you possibly now know which one is the one that really has the good deal? Um, we don't have the time to do that. The flow of information is constant and overwhelming. And so I think that's one of the core challenges of think tanks and in terms of communications and social media. How do you do that? And then finally, that I would say in terms of the question of a broad-based approach, um, I think that that makes total sense. But an interesting study by Heritage um, could tell and profile what was the social media or medium that is best uh, would reach certain audiences most effectively. And they could profile that. And so from my standpoint, whether it's someone telling someone that if you read this book, you could read that, if you can also identify what are the most effective means, those are the things that we need to do. And, we, and, and, and perfect that, and some of the costs are so high that that's where the community that's here needs to come together and figure out a way so it makes us all more competitive. Others that want to respond to that? Um, yes, I would like to, and that is that if there is too much information, um, two things. One is it's a great opportunity for think tanks because somebody needs to make sense of that. We get asked by people working in the ministries whose job it is to look at information and to condense it and provide meaningful messages for the political leaders, the ministers. Even the, the experts in the ministries now don't have the time anymore and they have to outsource that essential purpose of filtering information, analyzing it and finding out what is relevant and what is not. The second one I would say is think tanking is about the future. The future doesn't give us any information. All the data, all the stuff that overwhelms us is all about the past. Anybody who focuses on information and data too much and doesn't think about what might happen if is failing as a think tanker. Don't focus on all the information that floods. Step back and say, what does it mean and what would happen if? And then you're a good think tanker. Okay. We have time for one last question. Gentleman in the back has been patient. That's, that's me. You're I the think. gentleman yeah. in the back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You have the mic once again. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. We'll for take two because, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, thank you, first of all, for the interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Seppa. I'm the chief of staff at the Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Academy. And what we do is we train the new generation of UAD, UAE diplomats for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in uh, the UAE. Now, my, my question is, like what we notice is every year we have to review our curriculum with the experts in the field, with the help of one of your previous speakers, Akin Osebe, to look at culture diplomacy, with uh, one of your uh, upcoming speakers, Maxud Cruz, looking at uh, psychology of, of diplomacy, and so on. Now, what we notice as well is like to be a good diplomat, you also need to be a good researcher. So my question for the panelists is uh, a very broad question, first of all, to see what are the main skill sets that you're looking for in any researcher or any think tanker or anybody joining uh, your company. And then as well, it would be great as well if you could tell me how would you train these skill sets? Because what you could see is that in the 21st century, these skill sets change all the time. So what are the main skill sets and how would you train them? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to hold off on the response to that because that will be in the new business model. And then we'll take the last question which is over here. The last question is over here. Uh, Mohammed Hamdawi, Director of uh, Economic Studies at Trends. Thank you very much for your uh,
contribution. I'm fairly new to uh, the change hubs industry. So my background is in research and consulting in the private sector. And we struggled with the same issues. We struggled with it at uh, the change hubs. I like that term, I'm gonna use it from now on. So my question to you, if we can't compete on salary, and if some of the major think tanks don't, do not provide the career path that young researchers are looking for, um, and we are struggling with diversity from a gender perspective, from an age perspective, my observation is that we're biased towards social scientists. We have a lack of diversity in terms of the background of the researchers. Is that a real problem? Is that a correct observation? And if that's the case, what are we doing to attract pure scientists, mathematicians, data analysts, um, I would say philosophers? I mean, because we have to look at the issues from a holistic, pr holistic perspective, from a multidisciplinary perspective, and the bias towards social scientists have, a, you know, ways to address issues and analyze issues and come up with solutions that are completely different. So my question to you, is that a real problem? And if it's the case, what are you guys doing to address it? Thank okay. you. So once again, I think we'll, we'll capture that in the, the final uh, segment. Um, so we now, and um, uh, Tamiko, will start with you uh, and each person. Um, everyone has been patient and this has been a very rich discussion. I uh, ask you to, um, you're designing a new business model for think tanks. What are the core elements and core positions in this new business model? Tomiko? What yes, are, what, I'd you don't, be very you don't brief. Have to, it doesn't have to be exhaustive, yeah. but yeah. What, what are one or two yeah. of the, the key positions that you think are essential yes. for the new business model? I think I just mentioned my position was newly recreated to oversee the both management side and the research side. And I think this is a very good thing for a small organization like ours to really have a big overview of the connection between the administrative side research requirement and the new kind of models that we have to follow. So I think that, that is a good thing to have. By that, we are economizing. We don't have any HR director, any, any other kind of usual stuff that we, we need to have. But for that, you need to have someone who has had long experience on the management side rather than research side. Mm. So I think I'm treating that role very well. And just to re uh, respond to what we have to do in the kind of mindset in our kind of institutions, I just want to say the one word, one sentence that I was always repeated when I was dealing with kind of crisis management mode. I think always expect the unexpected and always be prepared for the unexpected. So I'll stop here, thank you. Okay, so <coughs> I'm gonna start in reverse and I will not leave uh, Charles to the last. So Hamid, could you, uh, and then we'll move up this way, Hamid, and then Charles. I don't know if the, your mic is working. Maybe you, if Hello? you can, yeah. oh, there you All go, right. now That's, it's working. There you go. Uh, with regards to the new model in terms of think tanks, uh, I believe it's sometimes it's as simple as utilizing partnerships and also making new partnerships, especially with universities uh, where universities have a diverse areas of specialization. So whenever you need somebody in a specific area of specialization, you can always communicate with that university that you want that person in order to help, help you, you know, uh, write a report or write a presentation or a study with regards to a certain topic. And also try to communicate with them even further, invite the researchers and scholars and, and, and also professors from these universities to, pr to give presentations through your own platforms. So in order to develop some sort of a relationship between you as an organization and these universities, in addition to partnerships with other think tanks uh, regionally and globally. Uh, and also uh, in terms of a new business model is, is, uh, is looking into the uh, utilizing technology in particular. Um, we might have, you know, during the pandemic, for example, it was difficult for us to travel from one place to another. But what we could do is that we could utilize researchers in a certain area of the world, you know, get into contact with them, get into a, a sort of a, an agreement with them to do a specific study on something, 
in particular. So I think these two things, sometimes it's as simple as uh, utilizing partnerships, I think will go a long way in the, in the continuity of think tanks globally. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Charles. And very quickly, first of all, um, a more diversified financial base. There was a question about this earlier. And we are now looking at local, regional, national, and international funding. Okay, so the city of Madrid funds us, the Spanish government funds us, the European Union funds us, and then we have public funding from places like Japan and South Korea. Okay, secondly, and contrary, this, this round counter, runs counter to one of the questions that our professor colleague uh, raised. Um, a more professionalized um, executive branch, if you like. Um, you know, we were wishy-washy, gentlemanly academics going about our business and hoping that this would be fine at the end of the day. It wasn't, okay? So professional fundraising, professional IT management, professional human resource management, um, all of that is, is going to be increasingly important in the future. Number three, a genuinely uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary academic uh, or research staff. Now, we've been paying lip service to this uh, for ages, but we haven't, you know, we've talked the talk, but we haven't really walked the walk, I feel. Uh, we actually bring together sociologists, political scientists, economists, IR specialists, but we don't actually very often look for people who are capable of bridging those disciplines within their own work. It's not good enough simply to encourage a sociologist to work with an economist. You know, I need a political scientist who has, you know, a pretty solid founding in international political economy, who can also talk to an IR expert or whatever, okay? Um, and finally, going, following from your very interesting point, um, you know, every year I look at the projects the European Union funds, and I never know whether I should laugh or weep or do both intermittently. Because basically, there are hundreds of institutions in the EU in our 27 member states basically doing the same thing and chasing the same money, right? So um, we've come to the conclusion that in many areas, we will never have the expertise necessary to be really outstanding. So we are beginning you know, to basically not do, not tackle major projects unless we have scholars from other European think tanks involved from the word go. And some of those scholars may end up becoming our employees, you know, if the relationship is satisfactory. And admittedly, some of our employees may leave us and end up working for rivals, uh, colleagues, however you want to classify them. But again, you know, we've been talking about collaborating for eons, but now, you know, given this shrinking market, we have to get real. and I can only support that. And as a practical advice, um, at Ecologic Institute, we have um, multi-desk offices, so every room has between two and usually four people in there. And I just make sure that if there is one economist in the room, the next one to go, there's a political scientist. After that goes an engineer um, or somebody else. I do not have rooms that have only one discipline, not the lawyers all in one place. It forces everybody to explain what they're doing in such a way that the others can understand it and they learn the jargon of the other disciplines as well. It's a very simple, practical way of forcing people to start thinking across the lines. So and this is really my business model, is um, build on what works. And when it comes to offering things instead of competitive salaries, by the way, we are obliged to pay salaries that are aligned with public sector pay. So that is competitive in some respects, but it's not competitive in other respects. But we, in addition, we give flexibility. People can go up and down with their working hours as life changes and, and their private needs change. They can do remote working. Um, they can um, reuse our networks with other think tanks, as you described, in order to do that. Um, providing meaningful work um, where curiosity is satisfied and where you have a story that you can tell your children and that you can tell your parents when you get home. This is what I did today. This is what I'm fighting for. That is worth um, an equivalent amount in salary. 
As we come out of the pandemic, it's pretty clear that there will be new think tanks being formed on public health policy. We were not prepared because we did not have contestation of the political ideas behind preparing for pandemics. We didn't pay enough attention and nobody was pointing out that we didn't pay enough attention. There were not enough people thinking through, there were not enough think tanks on health. And I think you will see that in the rankings that you provide. The same on education. It was, uh, we all are trained in mo molecular biology and, and uh, epidemiology. Within a very short period of time, we all learned that whoever understands interest, which is a precondition for signing a credit card uh, contract, actually understands um, exponential growth or exponential decline. We just didn't realize it. Our teaching at school and at university has not prepared people for the challenges, very practical challenges, during the pandemic. I think education will change. So will be the demand for how do we now transition. We now know that we also have a climate crisis, but that we have a chemical pollution crisis, that we have a loss of biodiversity crisis. We know what we don't need to do, but we don't know how to do it. Technology is there, but the political strategies for getting the right technologies in place and getting the wrong technologies out of place are not there yet. And that is something where there is an increasing demand already. I always underline that think tanks are very good at certain things that nobody else can do. One is asking what if questions to prepare for the unexpected. Another one is the word contestation of ideas, of data, of assumptions, making sure that we don't mist make mistakes in groupthink. That is the challenging. Um, um. The other one is scenarios. The political um, dynamic in Germany and in the European Union is driven by models. Models are complicated systems of linear equations. They can describe anything that is a marginal change from the current trends. They extrapolate the future from what we experience at the moment based on data. They can, by their very design, not deal with disruption. But disruption is what we're heading for, and disruption is what we experience with the pandemic. Forget models, use scenarios. That is what think tanks can do. Mm -hmm. Hudson Institute, very good at that. We are pushed into doing more advocacy. Um, when your staff goes to demonstrations in the street with their children and come back to work, then you have an intense pressure for the institution to engage with the advocates. We don't have to do the advocates ourselves, but we have to enable them. And that is something I think many other organizations will experience as well. And something that is even more difficult for think tanks that work with governments and have established relationships of trust with government officials is public interest litigation. Again, an area that is rising in importance. So much activity, al almost judicial activism is taking place at the moment. We as a think tank with lots of lawyers, we were the first environmental think tank to employ systematically lawyers to um, <laughs> provide that um, type of advice. We find ourselves in the situation that we cannot join public um, interest litigation, but we want to support it anyway. So this is one challenge. I leave you with. Thank you, but that's my new business model, Jim. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things in response to one of the questions uh, that I say at my own peril, um, coming from a university, uh, two things. One, the tyranny of academic disciplines, which is visited upon many of the institutions and creates silos. And then what I believe, which is a challenge for this uh, group, which I'll leave you with two challenges. One is that the greatest unfulfilled promise of think tanks is not creating truly interdisciplinary teams. Because they are not a part of a university, they should be liberated from that. But the tyranny of academic disciplines as a main feeder for think tanks has mitigated that. And then finally, we started the discussion of the new business model. I would like to issue a challenge both in terms of a new term for think tanks, but also what are the core elements? What are the key positions uh, that are essential for, that will help? Uh, because my fear is that if think tanks don't innovate, they will die. If they don't create a new business model, they will become extinct. And so it is this community today 
and tomorrow to think about what are the, the elements of the new business model. I want to thank all of you and especially uh, the panel um, for their contributions and all of you in terms of your questions. Uh, I hope we have launched the discussion uh, on uh, the talent that it will be required uh, for think tanks um, and set the stage for a very productive discussion over the next uh, day and a half. Thank you very much and thanks to the panel. Thank you very much, Dr. James McGann and all the panelists for that really enriching discussion. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Let us now move to the keynote welcome address, which will be delivered by His Excellency Mr. Maqsoud Cruz, Strategic Communication Advisor at the Ministry of Presidential Affairs in the United Arab Emirates. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. It's fine. First of all, and before we start the formal sort of address, I need to begin by welcoming each and every one of you to the sunny United Arab Emirates, the land of talent, creativity, and innovation. In fact, being here today with you is a great honor, and I have to congratulate both Trends Research and Advisory, as well as the University of Pennsylvania and all of you who are contributing your knowledge, your expertise, and your ability to enlighten all of us together today. And to be very also open about the nature of the subject and the topic that we're planning to discuss today and tomorrow. And maybe allow me to begin with a very simple quote from the great German writer Goethe, where he said, knowing is not enough we need to apply. And willing is not enough, we need to do. And frankly speaking, when we think about think tanks and when it comes to the issue of talent, it's the application, it's the result, it's the final outcome that matters the most, and it's the one thing that we're all being judged. Are we delivering? Are we producing? Are we able to take our thinking to the next level? And if we think about think tanks in terms of their ability and how they're able to take things to the next level, we always reflect on one thing that is the most critical and the most important outcome. What are the results and how we can achieve that and how far we can go. Now that they took all the furniture away, this <laughs> in a way explains why I had to hide behind the podium and now I can be more of being myself. You see, the key word today is talent. And all think tanks, no matter how great or big or magnificent they might be, it boils down to the simple ethos of the individual, the thinker, the one who has that magnificent sponge, or the one who actually can reflect and think and be able to see into the future. You see, it is in a form of a circle. Sometimes it has a beginning, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we hope for an end and maybe it doesn't. It's an ongoing process of developing ideas and thoughts. What I'm trying to do today is to share with you three main reflections. That's all, trying to trigger some sort of thinking, some sort of deliberation. No specific information, nor data, no numbers or knowledge, 
simply a reflection, a lazy form of exercise for the sponge between my own ears. The first reflection is this. What do we mean by talent? And how we can cultivate that talent? And where can we find actually the talent? Is it something that we bump into to? Is it a coincidence that we need to look into? Or it's a deliberation of a process where you have specific tools, specific systems of identification, looking into those who are important, who are different, who are basically unique, who can do what others can't. You see, think tanks are in the business of envisaging, imagining the future. Well, that's old story. I argue, given what we've seen with the pandemic, it's now in the business of creating the future, of designing the future, of being ahead of ourselves, and I would argue only through true talent that we can do that. Therefore, can we find the talent? How can we develop it? And if we did find the talent, if we did discover the talent, how we take that talent to the next level that it actually deserves? The second reflection, all think tanks are based on thoughts and ideas. It's based on this ability to generate something that we haven't seen before, maybe connecting invisible dots or being able to move forward with our imagination, creativity, and ability to take things to the next level. Having said that though, without proper understanding of the freedom of thinking, freedom of expression, being able to constantly allow these creative minds the different approaches of how we can imagine, if we don't have the necessary platform, if we don't offer the necessary opportunities, that is not going to take place. It will not happen, as simple as that. Therefore, as we emerge as think tanks, and as we look at the individuals who are these think tanks, that space, that ability to take things to the next level is absolutely important. One of the great quotes that I like of a great writer called Kafka, he starts in a very ironic way by saying, I'm a cage in search of a bird. And it's ironic because think tanks can feel sometimes this way. It's this mental cage looking for that bird to explain its purpose, its reason, its significance, and this takes me to the third and final thought I would like to share with you, that final reflection. How can we become something more than a cage? And how we can go beyond the assumptions of why think tanks even need to exist or need to explore or need to develop? How can think tanks move beyond the conventional ways of looking at them? Are think tanks there to validate what we're trying to say what we already know, is there any added value? Are we going to vanish at some point because we have some magnificent computing capabilities of certain intelligence that will take us to the next level? Frankly speaking, there's nothing that can beat the human potential. It is that ability to create, to innovate, to take things to the next level that we need not to forget and to constantly reflect and think about. To be very frank with you, with the event that we have today, where we're focusing on talent of different think tanks and having all of you from across the globe coming to this place specifically to generate specific ideas on what to do next, I think it's key and it's important to always remember and realize that the best is yet to come. And when we reflect on the future, the future is actually what we want it to be what kind of challenges we can envisage, what are the opportunities that we can create, and what are also the areas that we are missing that we need to cultivate. To be very frank with you, as we move forward with our debates and discussions, hopefully in the next uh, day or so, although this event is just one event, I think that exercise of constantly reflecting on all the thoughts and ideas should not just end by the end of this event. And frankly, we should be able to take this discussion even further and move forward with how we need to look into this, how we can understand it, and what we need to do in terms of our absolute collective wisdom and taking things to the next level. To conclude, 
today is not just about trying to get information and knowledge. It's not about maybe nice and fancy presentations or even great empirical data, those who are quantitative or qualitative, and this endless debate. To be very frank with you, today is about being bold, taking things to the next levels, looking into ourselves and reflecting in a very serious manner. The foundation of critical thinking has a wonderful definition that I personally endorse. Critical thinking is the awakening of the self to study itself. Therefore, if the awakening of our mind, if the awakening of our consciousness, if the awakening of our critical thinking, all these different processes that we have is missing and we claim to be the think tank, then I think we still have a lot to catch with and be able to deal with as well. So I hope that this place will be an awakening. This gathering and exchange will be the opportunity to take things to the next level. I would like to wish all of you a fantastic time, great exchanges, and I look forward to many debates and discussions as we move forward, not just for today or tomorrow, but hopefully for many months, maybe years, and I would even argue for infinity if we could dare. Thank you very much. Thank you.